episode, we're going to talk about the idea of changing culture, of becoming a leader, and and being a, a change manager. Someone, every single person is a leader. You're either a good one or a bad one, though. And you either have a lot of followers or you have no followers at all, but you still have divinity. You have a, a voice or a spark or, or something that you're called to, something that you're destined to. And what I want to do is I want to give you some key triggers on how to engage other human beings because one of the things that we've learned is that people, when they start to follow, when they start to listen, when they start to come alongside, we know that people will easily work for a paycheck. We see it all over the world that a person works easily for a paycheck, but we also see that people will die for a vision. And we want to move people over to inspiration, to voice. Some people call it love. You know, that there's that there's a level of engagement that we can cause people to come into. And one of the reasons or one of the ways that we help people do that is we purify our vision. We take the things that we believe we're doing and we purify the vision and we help engage it with the seven passions or the seven triggers of human engagement so that people will fall in love with the idea. It'll actually spark something in them. It'll cause them to be inspired at a higher level. If you have a pen and paper, the list that we're going to go over are the, are the seven triggers. There's actually, you're going to find out there's actually 14. There's seven on the positive side and there's seven on the negative side that are contradictory. And you're going to find that the seven triggers of human engagement are passion, wonder, voice, influence, change, urgency, and trust. Great leaders will use the left side of the chart. And dark leaders, Darth Vader and Hitler and some of the other crowd, they use the other side of the chart. And they seem to have the same level of following, the same level of dedication, the same level of kamikaze spirit that goes along with it. But it's coming from a dark side. It's coming from dark motivation. And when we find our influence in other people, it's very important for you to look at why are people following you, why are people listening to you, the type of company that you're hooked up with, the type of people that you're hanging out with, what are their engaging features, which side of the fence are they playing on, which side of the passion are they playing on. And Myers-Briggs teaches that there's 16 personalities. There are others that teach there's 32 personalities, and there's just a lot of different teachings, but almost everybody's heard of personality types, you know, a type A, a type B, a type C, and a type D. Most people also know that type A is the, is the aggressor. He's the CEO. He's the guy that gets things done. Type A is, is a very strong personality. He's normally the guy that loves to do public speaking, to be a dynamic salesperson. He's the, he's the get things done kind of guy. But what's hardly ever taught is the motivation behind those personalities. Let's use, for example, the type A personality, the aggressor. That if you have an aggressor who's doing his job and he's, extremely confident and he's out there conquering and he's doing great things and he's building companies and his motivation comes out of a place of vision. It comes out of a place of calling. It comes out of a place of destiny. It comes out of a place of divinity. It comes out of a place of glory. Then his vision will be replicatable and it will produce great fruit in the lives of the people that follow him. He won't be leaving dead bodies behind. But if you take the same personality type, someone who gets things done, but he's coming out of a place of woundedness or out of insecurity, or out of fear. If that person is still a type A personality, because we see the manifestation of personality type externally, but we've never really examined why that person is who he is. And what's interesting about personality types, when we help a person who's negatively motivated, in many, many cases, their personality type will change when we change their motivation. That someone who's aggressive and uh, obnoxious and pushy once you take the wound out of his heart, once you take the splinter out of his paw, that he becomes gentle, he becomes kind, and his personality changes because we've changed his motivation. And so we want to look at things like that. We want to be able to look at not just what type of personality we are or not that our vision is great or that we're making large sums of money, but why are we doing the things we do? It's part of the whole concept of purifying your purpose. Why do you do what you do? Because if you do it, if you do everything, if you, if you win the entire world and you lose your soul, what good is it? If you make millions and millions of dollars and you've wounded humanity in the process, if you preach the most amazing sermons in the world and, and you're, a dark ho you're a dark horse, what good did it do you? So we want to be able to look at some of these things. We want to look at the seven triggers 
that engage people and make sure that our motivation, that our core, that our foundation is done correctly. Trigger number one is passion. You know that um, people become inspired by passionate people, by vision. Passion is something that is caused by someone who has a grand vision. Make no small plans, for they have no power to stir men's souls. That passion is given by the grandness of the vision. It's also, you can take passion over how people care for one another. That passion for engaging large sums, numbers of people, making large amounts of money. That passion is also in the physical arena. The opposite side of that is called lust. That passion looks like lust. And for many people, they, can't, they don't even know the difference. That many people um, understand, with money, for example, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And yet the passion for large sums of wealth is not the love of money. That you can, you can be passionate about pursuing finance. You can be passionate about building great organizations. You can be passionate about what a large company will do for the masses and yet easily have someone standing right next to you with the same external vision or passion and yet internally it's just about lust. It's all about them. It's all about fulfilling their own internal desires that are never fulfilled. Passion is easily manifest in conversation. You can actually tell when you talk to somebody or when trial hits the company or when conflict hits your relationship, whether it's based on lust or passion. Cause yourself to find a vision that's grander than yourself. Cause yourself to be involved with a group of people that are doing things beyond normal human engagement. Mediocrity causes no one to die for a vision. Being normal or being good, good is the enemy of great. Turn up the fire on all of your dreams and visions. Take some of those visions and put fire under them, put passion under them. Make them, make them big enough to inspire. And then make sure that as you move forward that we keep our hands open, that we allow our visions and our plans and other people's ideas and other people's desires to be fulfilled in it. And it doesn't become lust. It doesn't become about us. It becomes about the pleasure of other people. So the next one on the list is wonder. Wonder is the core reason for genius. It's something that you see in the eyes of all small children. You know, it's that it's that fascination for new. It's, they look at everything as a brand new experience. Wonder, bringing people into a place of newness, bringing people into a place of looking at things from a different perspective. It's inspiring or instilling wonder in the people around you. You know, where are we going? We're going to great mystery places. We're going to learn things we've never learned before. We're going to see things we've never seen before. We're going to experience levels of relationship, and we're going to bring in new people, and we're going to do wondrous things. And what happens is we're actually made in our core to wonder, to dream, to desire for things that we don't currently have. The other side of that mystery is called mystique. Mystique is used by most of the cults. Mystique is used by some of the um, soundbite politicians. You know, someone will use two or three words to uh, engage a people and never really tell you what it means. Mystery, they're called lofty sayings, unprovable theories and philosophies, half-truths passed off as science, or deep thought. You know, some of the music that I list, used to listen to back when I was a teenager Back in the 70s, there were a couple of musicians that would play these, these lofty sayings, and they would sing these songs, and nobody knew what they meant, but it, you felt really cool by listening to them because you thought they were high. You know, they were, thought they were really cool. When you asked the, uh, later on when they interviewed some of these band leaders who, who made the words up, they said, well, what does this stuff mean? They go, well, we don't know what it means. We just put a bunch of words together. And it's interesting that people will, will fall for mystique, and it's based on a lie. Mystique is the same feeling. Internally, it's still one of the triggers that we can get a bunch of people. Adolf Hitler was a master at it. He would take a series of words and phrase them together and practice for hours in front of the mirror to take these, these mysterious theories and these unprovable philosophies and throw them out there to a group of people and inspire this mystique and inspire wonder based on a lie. There's a great book out right now called How to, How to Kill 11 Million People. And it was basically based on that premise alone, on the mystique versus wonder. Mystique is based on a lie or unprovable thoughts and theories. And actually ends up, you can see it generations later, most people look at history and see the ridiculousness of it. But at the moment, the passion that people follow, the lies and mysteries, want to improve on 
um, causing everyone to go back to a place of looking at everything fresh and new. Look at your life as a whiteboard, as your future is completely clear and you can write anything you want on it. That the ideas of life are allowed to spark in the heart of a person who's willing to wonder, to look at every truth that you have and re-examine it. This causes people to find genius, to find inspiration, and to find new thoughts, new ideas, and new ways of doing things that are not incremental, but dynamic. And what I mean by that is most people in society change incrementally. Change is so hard to get people to do. And yet, we can change as long as society changes along with us. As long as we change slow enough, as long as we move slowly toward a new dynamic or a new principle, society will change, either positive or negative. They can change incrementally. Look back after 20 or 30 years and see a great amount of change, but it happened very, very slow. Wonder causes the dynamic of Thomas Edison or Albert Einstein or Benjamin Franklin, to actually look at all its issues of life, politics and religion and science, and look at it from a place of wonder, and we can find genius in there. We need to look at our lives to see what areas of our life are actually intimidated or manipulated by mystique. You know, a lot of people go to church. You know, I think 40%, 40% of Americans um, say that they're churchgoers. And what's interesting about it is we've got 1,250 different denominations, all of them believing that they're absolutely true. And each one of them is sure that they're holding on to the basis of truth, which if one of them were absolute truth, that would mean 12, 1,249 of them were wrong. And so what's the likelihood that your current understanding of God, your, under, your current understanding of truth is probably wrong? One out of 1,249 is the likelihood that you have it right. And from my understanding, and in looking at almost all the denominations, I think one of the things we're all going to have in common is Jesus is going to say, you were all wrong. And so why don't we question those things? Why don't we ask and wonder, what is it about what we believe that's true and not true? How many things have we bought into or swallowed that are lofty sayings, that are unprovable philosophies? And we're actually are willing to look at our lives and clean those things up. It leaves us open for the true fruit, which is wonder. Voice. Voice I talked about two weeks ago when we talked about here finding your voice, helping other people find their voice. Voice is the individual divinity. Voice is your individual calling, where you want to be, how you want to get there. The, the contrary to that is pride, that a person thinks that they're better than someone else because they have a voice that's unique or because they're wounded in their life and they need someone to always be patting them on the back and telling them good things, that they can't hear any negative criticism. A person that runs from a person that runs from critique is a person who's probably walking on the wrong side of this. So we want to inspire someone to be unique and to sing their voice as loud as they possibly can, to do exactly what divinity, what God has called them to in their heart, and do it without pride. It's very possible for you to be the best karate guy in the world, but if you use it just to boast and push people around, and you've taken your voice, you've taken your strength, and used it to intimidate and to interrogate and to and to harass. But if you take that very same passion and you go into the impoverished sections of town and you help people for free to learn how to defend themselves, to learn how to become better people, to learn how to become strong, we've taken your voice, turned it away from lust, taken it away from pride, and moved it into, into the true divine purpose of the calling in the first place. And so you can actually see this in all the areas of life. With, with the other voices which we'll talk about tomorrow, that you have a contrary. Some people call it the yin and the yang. Some people call it the, the dark side of the force. You know, you can see people having tremendous amount of influence by boasting of themselves, by having the arrogance of saying that they're the best in the world at something. And then they always turn it into and always promote only them. And they're not using it for other people. The root of that is pride. And it doesn't reproduce anything but other prideful people. It doesn't help people become dynamic and become followers that will be generational in their effect. And that's the thing that we really care about more than anything else is leaving a legacy. Not only becoming successful ourselves and helping our friends become successful, but helping you carry it on for generations. That your children and your children's children, and they learn these things by using the correct side, by understanding the purifying your purpose, by understanding that passion and wonder and voice and influence and change and urgency and trust are the core motivations for all the things that you do. 
And it really comes down to love. When you actually look at the definition, when you take all these words together, for you to find, for you to be able to purify your purpose in all these other areas, it becomes about selflessness. It becomes about you doing things for a higher purpose than just you. The great thing is, is you get all the benefits of the other side. You get the pleasures of life. You get the mysteries and wonders. You get, you get all the finances that are necessary to do your job. You get everything there is to get, and yet you've done it from the right place. You've done it from the right core, and it reproduces the right thing. And now you not only have reward on this side, but for eternity. And I don't know whether you believe in heaven or you believe in karma, but no matter which religion, no matter which religion you are, there's a reward on the other side for what you do with this life. And so why not have a reward on all sides? Why not have money in the bank, friends, and influence, and have positive results on the other side? So that's the introduction to purifying your purpose through the seven triggers.